that's, a, that's a bit premature, to be honest. Um, <laughs> First off, I want to apologise for the uh, uh, inexcusably pompous title. That uh, was entirely my doing, uh, and I've never been able to sort of think of a, perhaps a uh, more accurate one. But anyway, um, what I'm going to attempt to do over the next uh, 45 minutes is to relay a prehistory, if you like, of the culture wars. Um, I'm going to start in the latter half of the 19th century and show how a section of Europe's cultural elite, a bourgeois intellectual elite, I should probably say, became disillusioned uh, with the values and ideology of bourgeois society. Uh, I'm thinking principally there of ideas of progress, liberalism, uh, and to a certain extent democracy as well. Uh, a process, I would say, in which bourgeois society's increasing inability to justify itself, uh, the inability, if you like, of, of capitalism to give rise to any values beyond itself, um, uh, certainly to justify itself, starts for the first time to be experienced as a problem, to be experienced, in fact, as a cultural crisis, uh, a crisis of meaning. Uh, not by everyone, of course, uh, and not by most, perhaps, uh, but it's there. Uh, and I think the post-1848 moment uh, is the moment at which uh, all this starts to emerge. It's the moment at which um, bourgeois modernity, capitalistic, liberal, formally democratizing, increasingly technological and instrumental, gives rise to its own broad but largely elite cultural and social uh, revolt. Um, and I'm going to suggest that this disillusionment and revolt ultimately feeds into uh, the Great War, well, the, the Great War, depending on your, uh, your perspective, in which Germany, uh, vitalistic, full of Geist, and promising the renewal of the world. Last year, in fact, I felt like I gave a very kind of sort of anti-German lecture. I, I don't mean to ever make it sound like that, but uh, unfortunately, it might be going that way. Um, Germany, vitalistic, full of Geist and promising the renewal of the world, is opposed to the decaying, uh, disenchanted bourgeois worlds of the Anglo-French axis. Uh, I will then look at how, after the Great War, that now open sore uh, uh, of the crisis of meaning, which was so pronounced in Germany before the war, is then pronounced across Western Europe after the war. It fuels, I think, the artistic avant-garde of, uh, of, of the late uh, 1910s and uh, 1920s, and it pushes more broadly intellectuals and writers into an ever more oppositional stance in relation to what is. And it plunges those who certainly you know, felt to a limited extent secure in the certainties and pieties of the long 19th century into a deep mode of self-questioning. Um, I think more broadly there was an intense sense of rupture at that moment, uh, that sense of a fatal break with the pre-war way of the world, uh, that in the rather flippant words of Virginia Woolf, sometime around 1910, it seemed that human character changed. Um, and I'm going to frame this portrait of the slow motion moral depletion of capitalism with everyone's favourite mustachioed philosophers. Of course, you can see the grand uh, macho muzzy of Nietzsche uh, there to my left, uh, which was popular in Shoreditch a few years ago, and the pinched neat little number of Martin Heidegger, which for unfortunate historical reasons is probably never going to be popular again outside the British royal family. Right. <laughs> Let's start. Uh, not to put too fine a point on it, uh, 1848 is the key year. It's the year, of course, in which there was a revolutionary upsurge uh, throughout continental Europe. Uh, in Britain, there's, you know, there's something roughly equivalent in the shape of the Chartist movement, which is still persisting, still pushing for change. Um, and it's the year that many of these revolutions, of course, were simultaneously crushed. So it's a moment of uh, radicalism, but also a moment of intense reaction. And it means that after 1848, uh, the bourgeoisie's ascendancy, I think, is in question, probably for the first time. It is coming under attack from working class associations and certainly from the 1860s emerging mass socialist parties. Um, and crucially, they start to arrogate the key tenets, if you like, of bourgeois ideology, you know, notions, you know, the mantles of progress, reason, freedom. They start to arrogate those to their own socialist cause. Uh, I guess, you know, a kind of shorthand would be that Marx becomes the heir to the Enlightenment, uh, not Schopenhauer and so on. Um, but bourgeois ideology, um, I think partially as a result of this working class challenge, also comes under assault from a, from a largely bourgeois cultural elite, as I've said. Uh, that is, it comes under assault from among those who, two generations earlier, uh, were cheering on uh, the French Revolution. Among intellectuals, writers and artists then, I think there was a, there was a growing uh, and I think possibly shared sense of the problem 
And it, this, are the, uh, this is how it's framed at this point in the, in the 1850s, 1860s, this problem of bourgeois decadence. And decadence, I think, is the key word of this era. Uh, it's a sense that the, that the society built in bourgeois interests, liberal, market-based, partially democratic, is kind of lacking a reason to be. It's unable to furnish life with any kind of sense of uh, deeper meaning. There's a sense that it's in kind of moral, spiritual decline. Um, bourgeois morality appears something of a sham. You know, everywhere, they, you know, everywhere seems to be hypocrisy that's identifiable. Uh, talk of progress and liberalism is starting to appear a little empty. And bourgeois culture uh, appears philistine, to use Matthew Arnold's words. You know, Matthew Arnold wrote, wrote those words in 1869. Um, Bourgeois culture starts to appeal kind of shallow, trivial. Uh, they know the price of everything, the value of nothing, etc., etc. Now, this cultural turn, uh, this uh, turn rather on the part of a cultural elite um, against bourgeois society, against the ideas of progress and liberty in whose name people once rallied, uh, this turn against the mores and uh, lifestyles of the bourgeoisie and the petty bourgeoisie uh, to an extent is the beginning, I think, of what we know now as uh, uh, modernism. Uh, it's the beginning of the modernist challenge. It's the point at which the cultural realm is established as a distinct realm, a realm in which one attempts to give a meaning to the world, turns against the meaningless, trivial realm of business concerns, again, to use Matthew Arnold's phrase. Uh, it's the moment, I think, when aesthetic modernity, modernism, turns against bourgeois modernity. I'll just drip that down my shorts. Um, the moment, sorry, I think one of the most striking early and lasting forms uh, that this revolt takes is that of um, aestheticism. And by that, I mean that art, the art of, uh, so the act of artistic creation itself be, uh, starts to be posited as an almost superior activity to the low, amoral business activity of bourgeois society. Uh, the aesthetic art starts to embody what bourgeois society seemingly lacks. It's a realm of meaning. It's a source of new value itself. Uh, this aestheticism, I think, has, uh, has romantic precedence. You know, the moment when the artist starts to be elevated as a singular creator of, of meaning and, 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 and you know, starts to be elevated as a genius, somebody who's able to conjure up worlds fr uh, from, you know, using the own, their own internal resources. Um, but even then, even then, even in that romantic period, that period when someone like uh, Shelley is, you know, claiming for the poet the role of a legislator for the world, even then you can see the difference between that kind of elevation of the artistic realm uh, and the elevation that starts to appear in, in, the, 18, in the 1850s. Um, because early 19th century romantics, and not just romantics, you know, people like Hegel too, uh, as disappointed as they may have been, say, with the trajectory of the French Revolution, uh, were still in some sense, I think, allied, if you like, with the bourgeoisie, allied with the revolutionary bourgeoisie, uh, whose mission, if you like, to throw off the, feudal, uh, the shackles of feudalism, was felt to still be of value, which was felt to be a mission for them and for the people as a whole. But post-1848 aestheticism is different. As I say, it rejects bourgeois modernity. It sees decay and decadence where once there might have been the prospect of progress. There is no sense anymore, I think, that uh, as the early 19th century utopian socialist uh, Saint-Simon said, the golden age lies ahead of us, not behind us. Um, and for example, you know, take two of the most important cultural figures of that post-1848 moment in France, Charles Baudelaire and Gustave Flaubert. Um, in Baudelaire's famous poem, The Flowers of Evil, which is published in 1857, he likens the poet in bourgeois Paris to an albatross on dry land. You know, he's awkward, he's ungainly, he's out of place. And in a sense, that's how he sees, the, that's how he sees poetry and art at that point, because it's as a source of value, it's somewhere out of place amidst all this kind of philistinism, this rank hypocrisy, the, the, the uh, sort of empty rationality of the bourgeois world. Uh, Baudelaire looks into the heart of modern Paris in many ways, which is the, in many ways the capital of uh, the 19th century, and he turns that filthy substance, as he sees, of bourgeois reality, the sin, the vice, the decadence and the poverty, uh, into so much sort of symbolist fodder. He works it up into art, and in that, act, that artistic activity, uh, he, sees, you know, he sees himself as somehow kind of redeeming some sense of meaning, some sense of value. Um, I would suggest that Flaubert's loathing of the bourgeois world is perhaps even stronger still. His most famous novel, uh, Madame Bovary, paints a scathing portrait of the, of the kind of um, uh, the, uh, 
the imbecility, if you like, of petty bourgeois life, of its pretense, its, uh, its shallowness, its pointlessness. Um, his heroine, Emma Bovary, uh, she's at once this kind of um, uh, plucky object of, uh, of sympathy. You know, she's doggedly following her heart and defying the stifling conventions of provincial bourgeois morality. Uh, but she's also, I think, the object of Flaubert's snobbery too. Uh, she's following her heart, but her heart is stuffed full of the, the cliches of romantic fiction, of the cheap romantic novels, if you like, uh, that were being produced for the you know, growing bourgeois female mass market. Uh, Flaubert's depiction, it looks like life, it looks like a realistic novel, but at the same time, he's suggesting that the life he's depicting lacks any sense of vitality. This is not a world in which there is anything of value, anything worth preserving. Um, as the great, uh, philo uh, well, great literary critic Eric Oyerbach said of Flaubert, his work appears to contain something like a concealed threat. The period in which Flaubert's writing is charged with its stupid issuelessness like an explosive. Now, Flaubert's answer to this decadence, to this decay which he sees all around him, he, he, he's not to ally, ally himself with any kind of socialist cause. He's not going to man the barricades. He's too kind of corpulent for that. You know, these are kind of hope bourgeois figures, not revolutionaries. Their, their solution, as I say, to the stupid issuelessness, the decadence, if you like, of bourgeois life, its meaninglessness, its futurelessness, is the act of artistic creation itself. In Baudelaire, it's the poetic act of transfiguring an ugly reality. And in Flaubert, it takes the form of an obsessive dedication to the craft of writing itself. So they establish this kind of opposition, this opposition of art versus life. Um, or later still, kind of art for art's sake as the decadent counterpoint, if you like, the decadence of bourgeois society. And I'm drawing attention to this, to this, to this moment, certainly this moment is in, in, in 1850s France. I'm drawing, ten, drawing attention to this because the moral depletion, if you like, of the bourgeois world is being generated from within, from within and by its very own cultural elite. Of course, many were not quite so disillusioned, but I think among uh, European, um, European intellectuals, uh, there, is, there is this sense of growing and profound disillusionment uh, for which the elevation of the aesthetic acts as a kind of consolation. And it's not, you know, it's not growing uniformly. I think in, in England it's not nearly so palpable, partially because class conflict is far more mediated. You know, it's generating reform rather than conflict. There isn't this sense of impending collapse, uh, th this sense of decay seeping out of uh, every aspect of social life. Whereas in France, of course, it's more intense. But I think it's what, what's interesting is that it's in post-1848 Germany that the bourgeois world comes under its most sustained cultural ideological assault. And I think that's because Germany, uh, as everyone knows, had still not undergone a kind of bourgeois democratic revolution as England had in the 17th uh, centuries, France in the 18th, you know, even Hungary has managed to have a successful one in 1848. It was yet to be a nation state. It was still a patchwork quilt of statelets in the 1850s and 1860s. But there were, of course, an increasing number of, of, of Germans, you know, officials, businessmen, and so on. In fact, the, the, German, the emerging German bourgeoisie, who were pushing still for the unification of German, uh, Germany as a single nation state. But, but, and I think this is absolutely key to understand why in Germany you get the most, um, the most vehement assault on bourgeois ideology. But they were pushing German... Uh, German, certain sections of the German society were pushing for this transformation, this unification of Germany after the outbreak of class conflict. And, you know, the revolt of, Silesian, uh, of the, the uh, Silesian weavers happens in the 1840s. Um, German, uh, Germans pushing for unification, they're pushing after the emergence of socialist organizations, after the radical democratic demands of, the eight, of 1848. They were pushing for it, in other words, in full knowledge of that spectre haunting European elites. So unlike the English and French revolutions where any sort of bourgeois versus uh, worker-peasant conflict could be submerged in some amorphous third estate, or the idea of the Englishman, or the idea of a people before emerging afterwards, after, after the change, after the revolt in a kind of split between moderate reformist elements and, a, and radical popular demands. Think Cromwell versus the levellers. Uh, German, German, 
Germany's bourgeois class couldn't do that. The conflict was already open, out in the open beforehand. So German nationalism in the period of its unification in the 1860s and 1870s acquires a different form to the one that it acquired in England and France. It is less liberal, it is less democratic, and as shown by the anti-socialist laws, uh, which uh, reimposed at various points throughout the 1870s and 1880s, it will be, it will be kind of full of a kind of anti-working class militancy. And it will be driven not by popular revolt, but by the Prussian state, uh, by the, you know, led by the Iron and Blood Chancellor, Otto von Bismarck. And I think this is important. The distinct form taken by German nationalism will be conjured up in the cultural imagination of the time, almost as an antidote uh, to the democratic weakness, you know, the liberal spiritlessness, in short, the decadence of its French and English rivals. It will be a bourgeois revolution, in fact, you know, it's still a, a single market to be administered by a central state, albeit one replete in kind of feudal hang hangovers, including a Kaiser but almost anti-bourgeois in name. It will even inform what appears to be an unlike, a uniquely German mission to combat the leveling down and the decadence of parliamentary democracies, liberalism and socialism and all the other rotten fruit of modernity. It would look like the promise of cultural regeneration and it would look like decadence is almost a problem for the bourgeoisie in other, in other places, other nations. Finally, this man, born in 1844 in I'm going to say picturesque rural Germany. It, it, it might well not be, to be honest. Friedrich Nietzsche is very much of this moment. He's a proud Prussian patriot, certainly when young. Um, and I love this. He was absolutely delighted when the Paris Commune fell in 1871. Uh, directly after its fall, he writes to his friend, Baron von Gerstorff. And we've all got a friend like Baron von Gerstorff. Hope, hope. This is the other thing, I'm going to read Nietzsche, but I don't know if I should do it in a special Nietzsche voice. You know, there was a particular bombastic tone I should have. Hope is possible again. Our German mission, note this phrase, German mission, isn't over yet. I'm in better spirits than ever, for not yet everything is capitulated to the Franco-Jewish levelling and elegance. There is still bravery, and it's a German bravery, that is something else to it than the elan of our lamentable neighbours. You know, he's a very modest man. Um, and in a sense, that's Nietzsche's politics, I think, in a nutshell. There are, fluctuation, there are fluctuations. He has a kind of brief flirtation with parliamentary democracy, but only really as a means to an end in, in, in the 1870s, late 1870s. But by and large, he's a principal spokesman for this peculiar form of anti-bourgeois, bourgeois nationalism. So what of Nietzsche's actual work? Um, I think essentially Nietzsche assumes there was a way of life, a way in which humans can be, which is in accordance, if you like, with their true with their nature, our nature, which is to say he has an overwhelming sense that we are naturally other than we are today in society, that there is a way of being and becoming which is to act in accordance with our instincts, uh, with our drives. Uh, it, is to be it is to be a sensual, uh, desiring body. It is to be close to the earth, uh, a wild beast. You know, these are the kind of recurring motifs of, um, of I'm going to say, thus spoke Zarathustra, which uh, has been haunting me as a, as, a, as a childhood lisper. And this way of being has been suppressed, crushed, leveled down, perhaps even erased by the moral demands of the herd, by the repressive morality and values of social life. And for read social life, you can read effectively bourgeois social life, the, you know, the, the, you know, the, the crushing morality, uh, petty morality of bourgeois social life. So at a mythic kind of trans-historical level, Nietzsche is condemning ostensibly Christian society for forcing us to live against ourselves, against our instincts, against what he says in the genealogy of morality is the essence of life, namely the will to power. Uh, that is our core, that is our most natural instinct and it's being suppressed. And you can see this fundamental dualism of vitality, of a vi vitalistic realm versus a stultifying sociality in The Birth of Tragedy, which is his, 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 his first proper work, which is published in 1872. But at that point, his revolt, partly, I think, because of his allegiance to Richard uh, Wagner, they, of course, famously fell out, and Wagner said that Nietzsche went a bit soft in the head because he masturbated too much. So it was a very acrimonious falling out. Partially because of his allegiance to Richard Wagner at this point, um, Nietzsche's revolt, I think like 
Baudelaire's, like Flaubert's, is principally an aesthetic one. So in Birth of Tragedy, he returns to the pre-Socratic ancient Greeks, as actually Heidegger will, will too later. And he famously contrasts these two modes of artistic production. Uh, the one involves uh, reason and self-control. He says that's the Apollonian. And I think architecture would be a very sort of Apollonian mode of, um, uh, of artistic production. But the other... The Dionysian, as he calls it, and he's referencing the ancient uh, festivals of Dionysus. But the other, the Dionysian mode, you've got to think dance, music, you know, kind of just, I don't know, shaking, like Ian Curtis or something. Like that, 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 that's a kind of Dionysian mode of uh, artistic expression. It's precisely that in which humans express their true nature. Um, in the, and, this, and he writes, in the Dionysiac dithyram, uh, that's a kind of hymn sung and danced in honor of uh, Dionysus, he writes, man's symbolic faculties aroused to their supreme intensity. The essence of nature was now to find symbolic expression. And further on, he writes of how one loses oneself in this act of Dionysian artistic expression. One loses one's self-control. One almost frees oneself of you know, repressive social forces. Um, and he writes, and hitherto hostile nature refines her lost son. Or to put it another way, in relinquishing oneself, in letting it all hang out in a kind of crazed dance, in letting oneself be uh, one, the lost son finds nature again. You know, everything's kind of reconciled in a Dionysian mode. And he writes, man is no longer an artist, he's become a work of art. Uh, the artistic power of the, whole na of, ho of the whole of nature reveals itself to the supreme gratification of the primal oneness amidst the paroxysms of intoxication. At this stage, then, as I say, Nietzsche, like Flaubert, like, like Baudelaire, like, the, uh, like earlier romantic theories of art, in fact, frames his revolt against bourgeois society in terms of the aesthetic, in terms of art. That in art, one expresses what society denies, which is, as Nietzsche sees it, human nature, instinct, drive, life, vitality. But Nietzsche soon rejects this earlier aesthetic position. He dismisses it as an artist's metaphysics, just as he dismisses Richard Wagner himself. Um, but I'd maintain that that Dionysian moment never really goes away. It's, that in, it's just that instead of um, man becoming himself in art, he's to become himself in life. Instead of creating art, this is key, I think he's going to create values. Now, Nietzsche's critique of modern society's decadence, his critique of bourgeois modernity, also deepens, I think, at this point. Uh, the basic assumption is still the same. The bourgeois society's morality, its values, liberal, egalitarian, democratic, suppress what is natural in man, his instinctual drives. And he writes, he writes of these, everything in the organic world consists of overpowering, of dominating. So that's being repressed. That's being, everything's being leveled out, so no one's really able to rise to the, rise to the top. Um, but Nietzsche goes further by attempting to explain how this happens, especially in the, in, in the Genealogy of Morality, which is published in 18, 1887. There he asks, in what conditions did man invent morality? In what conditions did he invent the ideas of good and evil? Because he insists they are simply invented. They're not handed down from up on high by God. And Nietzsche argues that their foundation lies not in an eternal idea of right, but in sheer might, effectively. And so the mighty... Uh, defeating and then ruling over the weak as masters over slaves, uh, they create values because they judge their actions as good and noble, and they judge the slaves and their actions and so on. They judge them bad. Uh, they even they give them um, pejorative names. They give them pejorative values. They're common, uh, plebeian, and so on. And that is how values and morals are created in Nietzsche's world. Uh, the masters determine what is esteemed and what is not. They are the creators of value, the evaluators, if you like. Now, Nietzsche's pretty hap happy with that kind of state of affairs. Uh, that's just hunky-dory. You know, humans have exercised their will to power, and society has organized itself according to a strict but natural hierarchy. But there's a problem. The weak, the put-upon, and so on, they develop a, what he calls resentment towards the masters, a deep psychological loathing, which becomes, as Nietzsche puts it, creative and gives birth to its own values. Um, or better still, it transvalues the values of the strong. It reverses them. This is the moment the noble master's morality is superseded by what Nietzsche calls slave morality. But such is the strength of resentment, it's, po you know, it's a poisonous, vengeful pathology, that noble values of strength or conquest and so on are presented, well, not just presented as negative as bad, 
they're presented as evil and therefore they're to be you know, subject to continuous punishment. And the values, uh, the values of the weak, the slaves, are given a positive spin. And in that sense, the, the weak and the slaves avenge themselves almost forever upon the strong. They force them to submit to their values, to accept that everyone, says is possessed of equal dignity, that one must love thy neighbour. And Nietzsche really does not love any of his neighbours. <laughs> and because slave morality, which Nietzsche says begins with the Jews, avenges itself on the strong, on those who have manifest their natural instinct to domination, it avenges itself then on what is most natural, uh, what is most vital in man, his will to power. So by asserting in the slave morality of Christ Christianity that all are equal before God in creating a tablet of commandments to keep men in line, Nietzsche says, we've not only lost our fear of what is most natural in man, but we've lost our love for him too. Um, that's from the genealogy of morality again. Slave morality, vengeful and punitive towards man at his most natural, not only represses then what is most vital, what is most natural in man, in doing so it fuels what he calls nihilism. Because in suppressing our nature, our vitality, our will to power, we end up willing nothing. Right? So our age, our age in which slave morality is, is triumphant, writes Nietzsche, is the age of nihilism. God is dead is another way of putting it. Um, nihilism is the conceptual twin of decadence. Nietzsche therefore urges the destruction of the current tyranny of slave morality so as to overcome, regenerate, reinvigorate, revitalize. Uh, everything of today, he writes, in, th in Thus Spoke Zarathustra, it is falling, falling into decay. Who would want to keep it? But I, I would give it a further push. Interestingly, in imagining these individuals, these creative destroyers, these ubermenschen, each asserting uh, his or her will as an evaluator, as a creator of values, Nietzsche anticipates the culture wars, a massive contest over values where everybody's out there, putting their values to the test, arguing, fighting over them. He writes, on a thousand bridges and footpaths they shall throng towards the future, and more and more shall war and, be in and inequality be set amongst them. Devisers of images and spectres they shall become in their enmities, and with their images and spectres they shall yet fight their highest fight against themselves. Good and evil, and rich and poor, and high and lowly, and all the names of values, weapons they shall be, and clashing signs that life must itself overcome itself against again and again and again, which sounds fun. Um, but Nietzsche also often, also often resolves the problem of decadence through the singular redeeming figure, a singular creative evaluator who could restore and revitalize simply through his unvarnished will to power and his willingness to judge what he wills to be good. This man of the future will redeem us from the great nausea, the will to nothingness, from nihilism, writes Nietzsche. Now, sometimes this figure is specific. Sometimes it's, uh, it's Napoleon who, uh, who Nietzsche venerates. Um, sometimes it's what Bismarck should have been if he hadn't made too many concessions to liberal democracy. Um, and here we're bringing Nietzsche back down again from his allegorical heights, uh, I think, to the prosaic historical reality, which he was always, always addressing. He wants effectively a strong leader who, through force of will, will reevaluate re the world, will give it some meaning, give it some purpose again. And the slave morality he opposes, the vengeful, punitive life suppressors, are equally of this world. Um, they're, as he puts it in the Antichrist, they're the socialist rabble undermining the worker's sound instinct, good spirits, and sense of contentment, making him envious and instructing him in vengeance. That is Nietzsche's social vision, if you like, a strong leader revitalizing and uh, infusing the world with me meaning, uh, ruling over a, a, effectively a, a contented slave class, free of envy and potential resentment. Now, Nietzsche dies in 1900. As I say, I don't know if it is from excessive masturbation, but he does. But his influence is rapidly growing. Is it, he, Nietzsche's far more influential towards the end of his life when he's losing his mind and certainly afterwards uh, when he's dead. I don't know if he'd appreciate that. Uh, his influence is rapidly growing in Germany. It helps that it's allegorical, that it's aphoristic, because it can always escape from any political specificity. Um, in this case, bourgeois decadence and, I think, socialist resentment. Uh, and it can then be easily repurposed. Now, Nietzsche continues to have an incredibly vital afterlife. 
Um, and of course, Nietzsche's legacy uh, and his prevalence is, is helped by his virulently anti-Semitic sister who packages up his work into kind of handy, uh, bite-sized, you know, B-Euro Nazi chunks. But more than that, more than that, Nietzsche's work resonates. It captures, I think, in peculiar, you know, there's no doubt Nietzsche is a, is a fantastically acute, I don't know, cultural critic. It, it, it captures, I think, in peculiarly intense form, the deepening sense among a cultural elite of what, it, of what feels like the cultural, the cultural crisis of capitalism, of liberal democracy and its socialist spawn. Uh, and of course, he gives it names. He gives it the age of nihilism. He gives it a slogan, God is dead. And he provides a diagnosis. Slave morality is repressing, suffocating our most vital, most natural and most human instincts. And you can see its influence uh, most spectacularly perhaps on Sigmund Freud, who, when philosophizing as he does in Civilization and its discontents, conceives of civilization in opposition to, the, to, to, to you know, instinctual drives and so on. And you see it again, I think most interestingly, in Max Weber, who, in his 1919 Science as a Vocation lecture, channels Nietzsche at his most pessimistic. Our age is characterized by rationalization and intellectualization, he writes, and above all by the disenchantment of the world. Now, Weber's age of disenchantment is Nietzsche's age of nihilism reworked. After all, what is it to say that the world is disenchanted other than to say that the religious, sacral meaning with which our activity used to be invested has disappeared, died? It's just now, it's just stock taking, it's just profit margins, it's just means masquerading as ends. Weber continues, the resulting fate of our age is precisely the ultimate and most sublime values have withdrawn from public life. But Weber's vocation lecture comes in 1919. Um, as we should see, after the Great War, few think well of the world, few of any word, good words to say about liberal capitalism. But what's interesting is that Weber also thought this before, before the war. It shows that Nietzsche had long been the prism through which he and many others had come to understand and critique the development of bourgeois modernity. And you can see this in the Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism, which is published in 1905. There, again, he argues that the religious ends, which once sanctified, say, the increase of capitalism end in itself, which gave meaning to our activity in the sense of a work ethic, which once gave instrumental reason, its, its reason to be, uh, that these have decayed, they've died. Uh, the result is a Nietzschean image of man's self-domination. Uh, and I'll quote this in full because it's a marvellous quote. The Puritan wanted to work in a calling. We are forced to do so. For when asceticism was carried out of monastic cells into everyday life and began to dominate worldly activity, it did its part in building the tremendous cosmos of the economic order. The order is now bound to the technical and economic conditions of machine production, which today determine the lives of all individuals who are born into this mechanism. Not only those directly concerned with acquisition with irre irresistible force, Perhaps it will, it will so determine them until the very last ton of fossilized coal is burnt. In the Methodist view, the care of external goods should only lie on the shoulders of the saint like a light cloak, which can be thrown aside at any moment. But fate decreed that the cloak should become an iron cage. And there are countless other examples of this sentiment uh, across Europe, but particularly in Germany. Uh, this fin de siècle si sense that while the economy might be growing, that while we might be progressing in a bourgeois sense, that we're becoming, as Nietzsche puts it, better natured, cleverer, more comfortable. Uh, we have lost something. We've lost a sense of why, a, lost a sense of mission, of purpose. And the more and more intense this cultural disillusionment becomes, the more intense is the, is the demand, if you like, for the revitalization of the world. Um, and this, I would suggest, is almost how many in Germany's cultural and political elite, and increasingly beyond, conceived of Germany's mission in August 1914. Its enemies are France and England, but they're not just imperial adversaries, although they are that too. They are cultural adversaries. They're the embodiment of the trivial, trivial shallow, dispiriting uh, bourgeois world. Uh, the historian, um, uh, Modris Eckstein's In Rights of Spring, puts this well. Most Germans regarded the armed conflict they were entering in spiritual terms. Until September, the government and military had no concrete war, em, uh, war aims, only a strategy and a vision, that of German, German expansion in an existential rather than physical sense. 
This sense of Germany's existential mission cuts across class and party in, 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 in 1914. Staunch liberals like Theodor Heuss said he was convinced of Germany's moral strength and superiority. Uh, even a liberal left type like Konrad Hausmann, he said, in Germany there is a single will in everyone, the will to assert oneself. You know, they, they sound like they are they are just imbued with Nietzschean sentiment. Even the social, uh, even the social Democrats spoke of defending culture and thereby German culture, and thereby def and thereby freeing Europe. And tellingly, even the depressive Max Weber was tremendously excited by the prospect of war. This was Germany's chance, if you like, to smash the iron cage of rationality. Now. This will sound almost glib. Uh, Germany loses the war, I think. But in many ways, Nietzsche still wins because what moral authority bourgeois society and capitalism had after the war is, is virtually gone. It's, it's dried up, not just in Germany, but in France and even England too. The age of nihilism looks to be well and truly upon Europe. Uh, most obviously, there was an irretrievable sense of rupture. Um, a civilization perished in 1914, writes the historian E.H. Carr, and no return is possible. Elsewhere, uh, this is uh, Len Leonard Wolf, uh, kind of Bloomsbury Group patriarch. Uh, in those pre-1914 days, there was an ordered way of life, a law, a temple, and a city, a civilization of th sorts. After the war, there's just hatred, fear, and self-preservation. And the poet Siegfried Sassoon echoed Wolf's sense of rupture, of loss. What a peaceful world it was and what a bullying, barbarian world it is now. And Nietzsche himself is actually being read and, well, read and used more than ever, I think, outside Germany now. He informs D.H. Lawrence's vitalistic appeal to sex and the, and the quick of life. Uh, and he's a strong undercurrent in writers as different as Wyndham Lewis, James Joyce, Jer uh, George Bernard Shaw. Um, and interestingly, his work seeps into a high cultural assault, actually, on the English middle class, the clerk, the uh, dweller in the newly built suburbs, the mass of dolts, as Ezra Pound called them. Uh, as D.H. Lawrence put it in the, in, in, the, in the kangaroo, that the mass of mankind is soulless. Most people are dead and scurrying and talking in the sleep of death. This, if you like, is a, is a mass moment of, of societal self-loathing in which a cultural elite turns against uh, mass culture, turns against um, bourgeois culture. Uh, but elsewhere, amongst avant -garde of, uh, other European avant-garde, the post-war disenchantment has fueled something like Nietzsche's idea of creative destruction. Uh, so you have the emergence of Dada uh, in, well, it's largely a German movement, but it emerges in, in Zurich in 1917, strangely at the same moment that Lenin's there. And with Dada, you see the self-conscious creation of what they call anti-art, you know, of unstructured theatre performance, of, uh, of nonsense uh, sound poems, uh, cut-up poems that have no meaning. Uh, and its creators, they want to shock, they want to cause offence, they want to outrage, as far as they're concerned, their bourgeois audience. That's who they're aiming it at. In Italian futurism, which of course emerges before the First World War, but postdates it too, you have a self-conscious war on the old, on tradition, on everything that reeks of that long 19th century, in one of their countless manifestos. And the thing is about a lot of these avant-garde of the 1910s and uh, 1920s, it's their manifestos which are the only things which you can really read now. Um, in one of the Futurist Manifestos, Marinetti writes, we will destroy the museums, libraries, academies of every kind. We will fight moralism, strangely, feminism, every opportunistic cowardice. They seek instead, the Futurists, to fuse what they consider to be the vital energies of the age in technology, especially in technological war warfare, in the car and the gun. They want to fuse with these energies. That's where the meaning uh, is to be sought. They seek to leave behind the bourgeois self and indulge in some form of, you know, high-tech uh, Dionysius, a Dionysian self-expression. Um, and over and over again, you see, you, you see something similar. I, I, I can mention surrealism, surrealist manifestos. Again, they they denounce bourgeois world as shit. They use the word shit. It's it's crap. Uh, the, its products are, are meaningless, empty. Um, Andre Breton, I remember, describes a, a naturalistic or realistic writer describing a room. And he says, what on earth does this description tell me? It tells me nothing. I don't care what color the, what color the wallpaper is or how the light is hanging. Um, none of this means anything anymore. 
and mirroring the futurists, they seek out another way of being that is truer and closer to who we really are, as they see it, in the workings, I guess, in the, in, in the workings of the unconscious or the subconscious. Over and over again, you see similar flights away from the empty, deconsecrated forest of the social world, as Marcel Proust had it, and then flights into the interior world of monologue, of streams of consciousness, um, an interior world where meaning can be conjured up again. So I think post-war modernism is the crisis of bourgeois legitimacy at its most explosive and at its most creative. More broadly, I think I, uh, George Orwell captures well just how pervasive this crisis of meaning was in his 1939 novel, Coming Up for Air. I have enough sense to see that the old life we're used to is being sawn off at the roots. There are millions of others like me, ordinary chaps like me everywhere, chaps I run into in pubs, bus drivers, and traveling salesmen for hardware firms. They've all got the feeling that the world's gone wrong. They can feel things cracked and collapsing under their feet. Now, I promised to frame this discussion with the, uh, with the other great moustache, Martin Heidegger. It's not a great moustache, it's a rather meagre one. Martin Heidegger. And I'm going to do that in hopefully uh, no more than two minutes. Um, <laughs> Being in Time, published in 1927, uh, but it's been brewing a lot longer before that. Now, at first glance, it looks intimidating, but a bit niche. Um, and given its refusal to use a traditional philosophical vocabulary, it looks pretty incomprehensible. Um, I'm not going to delve too much into... Heidegger's use of language, although it's absolutely essential to understanding Heidegger, but I'm going to say what makes Being in Time remarkable is that it provides, I think, one of the most thoroughgoing critiques of modernity, certainly of bourgeois modernity. Uh, perhaps not obviously at first. At first it looks like he's going to simply show how the world comes to appear to us, how it acquires its meaning for us. And it's a very complicated explication, but essentially it boils down to this. Uh, you know, I'm thrown into the world as an individual. He calls it individual Dasein, but lots of, lots of debate about that. Thrown into the world, I always already find myself in the world. I come to relate and understand my there, my world around me, principally through my, the use I make of things around me, uh, the ready to hand, he calls them. Um, so that's how we principally come to engage with being with the world, through the use, uh, the, the use we make of it. Um, and then he says there's, a, there's another form of knowledge as, as well, which is a kind of second-hand theoretical knowledge. He calls that present hand. We don't need to worry too much about that, at, well, perhaps ever. But more than that, more than that, he says, uh, Dasein, I'm going to, for the sake of clarity, I also always already find myself in a world with others. And this is where the critical, um, destructive element of Heidegger starts to emerge. Because the problem of being in the world with others is that I tend to see myself in terms of those others. I act and think not as myself, but as one would. Uh, that is, I, I start to think and act in terms of the they, as, uh, as the translation of Heidegger's Das Mann has it. Um, this... This social uh, milieu, this they, this um, repressive social force, even prescribes, right side, even prescribes one's state of mind and determines how one sees. He puts that in inverted commas. And this mode of being in the world with others, performing social roles, sharing, you know, having shared values and so on, this Heidegger will say, and damn, as inauthentic. Uh, he says this isn't a moralizing analysis. He's got nothing against being inauthentic. But by and large, people don't have this desperate aspiration to be inauthentic. It feels and looks like a moralizing analysis because that's what it is. You know, inauthenticity is not being oneself, not seizing, uh, what, not taking responsibility for one's own life. That's how Heidegger sees it. And that, that, it, that is a bad thing. And Heidegger sees it as a bad thing. And of course, Heidegger then will go on to talk about angst or anxiety uh, as the mood in which one becomes aware of one's inauthenticity, a mood in which one is wrenched from the common understanding of the world and oneself and becomes aware of one's irreducible finitude, that this is my life and I've got to make the most of it. You know, that's a very dumbed down interpretation, but that's roughly what it feels like. Now, what I would say that Heidegger establishes then in Being in Time and Beyond is the fundamental illegitimacy of bourgeois modernity, which he presents as this being with others. Uh, he says that it almost always will foster an entirely inauthentic sense of self. So it's always going to be creating um, inauthenticity. And that therefore, within this place, this world with others, this bourgeois world, you will never, you will never be yourself. 
So he also establishes then, I think what first Alexander Kolchev in his 1930s lectures on Hegel, which is heavily influenced by Heidegger, and later Jean-Paul Sartre in Being and Time, calls our essential, our essential non-identity. Um, and that means that we are not, as, a, we are not um, as society as others demands or expects of us. We are, can always be other, we are not, we are not a thing. Um, now, on the one hand, this is the condition of existential freedom. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a positive moment, um, the, the chance to um, take hold of ourselves and uh, you know, constantly be in the process of becoming ourselves through our choices and actions. But on the other hand, and I think this is intriguing, I think it does something else. Um, in asserting that we are defined by our essential non-identity, which is there in Heidegger and extrapolated in 1930s and particularly 1940s France, in saying that we are defined by our essential non-identity, it starts to turn identity into a quest. The search, if you like, for the moment when you do become self-identical, when you do coincide with yourself, when you effectively become uh, a thing, uh, when your quest is actually to be this person and to have it recognized. So even then, I think, in some microscopic form, there is the seed amidst the wreckage of bourgeois ideology of the identitarian form that the culture wars will take. And that is my conclusion. Wow, thanks very much, Tim. Um, so we've got time for uh, questions, points. Um, you might want to ask, there's a lot in there, so you might want to ask Tim about some of the things that were in there. You might want to present kind of alternatives. Um, we'll try and get everybody in who wants to speak. So let's just start at the front here, and then we'll kind of work our way back that way. Uh, hi, Tim. Yeah, thanks a lot for the talk. I really, is it, can everyone hear? Yeah. I really liked it. I thought it was really interesting and thorough. Um, just one little thing on, on Heidegger is, I mean, he, he said Sartre, for example, got him all wrong. And I think that's partly that Heidegger was fundamentally pessimistic. He, he had this notion of authenticity, but he, he believed we were always falling away from it. And from reading book Being in Time, I never really sort of associated that so much. I think maybe politically, but not philosophically, with bourgeois modernity specifically. I mean, he traces it back, as he does, all the way back to Aristotle and all the rest of it. Um, but, but the fundamental point was, I think, on this notion of authenticity that Sartre and others took up, took up that Heidegger was not propagating that really at all. He, he kind of saw it as something we're, we're always striving for, we might strive for, but we never completely get there. Okay, thanks. Kevin? Yeah, really interesting talk. Um, I agree with your point about 1848. I like your periodization, but there will be many who don't like that periodization. I think you'd probably have to defend it against a lot of historians I can think of. Um, I think it's a good, you know, the working class coming upon the stage of history is absolutely right. And I was just thinking of Gobineau and his whole concept of degenerance, I can't say it, degenerescence. Uh, degeneration in French, basic, but meaning something slightly different. Um, that's a Canadian education for you. Everybody. But uh, I, I think it's a, a really, I mean, the problem with Gobineau is, is you're right to concentrate on Nietzsche because Gobineau is a bit of a half-wit. If you read too much of what he's doing, it's just, it's, it's like a, a dumbed-down version in, in some ways. But he's expressing the same thing. The problem that you have, though, is, in terms of historians, is that a lot of them will argue with Sternell uh, saying, oh, uh, this is just romanticism. So we can actually trace this back to uh, uh, any response to the Enlightenment from Herder, uh, which is what Sternhill goes on, if you, if you think of that Sternhill book. Um, you know, that it's, it's just simply romanticism, and so therefore we can group uh, Nietzsche and uh, even Heidegger, perhaps, with the romanti romantic, uh, you know, response to the, the, uh, re to the, to the uh, French Revolution and to the Enlightenment. So I'm just wondering how you would answer that. I think it's an it, interesting problem. Okay. If you can just hand it back to behind, yes. Um, so Alan Bloom, in the closing of The American Mind, um, links Nietzsche back to uh, Rousseau and then um, before that to um, 
a sort of uh, split between uh, what the Enlightenment thinkers thought about man in the state of nature and then what came before that, the sort of split um, in man's nature that he had to sort of suppress something uh, in public life um, as well. So I just wondered if you think that link is there and is valid. Um, and then the other thing, I'm, I don't think Blue mentions it, but um, it also occurred to me there's also Marx's theory of alienation. And how do you see that sort of fitting in here as well? Short question. Um, yes, just pass it along. Just Thanks. Yeah, uh, also actually uh, referenced in Bloom, uh, he talks about um, both how Nietzsche and Heidegger uh, more or less torched the philosophical past itself um, by going back to the pre-Socratics and to attempt to get back to that uh, state, n not a Rousseauian state of nature, but back to that state before you know, you're even thinking about uh, uh, being as we understand it. And I'm just wondering, is there an analogy between that and uh, you, you mentioned how uh, Nietzsche and Heidegger sort of anticipate some of the uh, culture wars we're living through at the moment and that easy repudi repudiation of the past uh, but it's lost the dimension that they brought to it but that, that is one of the things that one of the legacies that we're perhaps uh, left with and to just behind you to James yes just behind yeah, I was, um, uh, as you were um, going through it, I was thinking about uh, the difference in uh, uh, style of writing. You know, Nietzsche's very aphoristic, uh, kind of playful, um, uh, just at the point when you think you're going to pin him down, it jumps, it's a new paragraph, it's a new thought, and though there's a con kind of consistent theme, um, uh, it's quite broken up in the way it's presented. Whereas the thing that makes you think maybe it was Heidegger who was mad is, is it's so completely thoroughgoing. And I think that's the hardest bit to convey, is that it's really intense uh, technical philosophy um, in that um, as he's developing his categories, uh, you know, with the Mitzsein and the, the Dasein and all the rest, um, he really, it, 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 like Hegel, um, it, it, it feels like he can't move on until he's exhausted every aspect of the, the particular proposition and then he's going through to the next, except he's do, kind of doing the opposite of Hegel in that it's more about stripping out, you know, the project really is about, um, I think he calls it the destruction of ontology, a kind of a return to a lost moment uh, uh, before we went wrong. You know, there's a, he's got this idea that... Uh, uh, thought has gone down the wrong path by becoming abstract and um, uh, universal. Uh, uh, and he's trying to uh, go back to that point uh, before, uh, well, uh, and the, the points change. You know, sometimes it's Cartesian thinking and then it becomes uh, um, platonic. Uh, you know, he wants to go back. He's always going back, uh, looking for this lost moment and trying to write, a, uh, write in a way that... Um, will use none of the abstract concepts that we use in ordinary language, which ends up with this intensely difficult um, uh, text that you feel like uh, you've been punished uh, for reading. Or worse, uh, if you're about um, uh, 23 and you read it, you feel like you're a great vic uh, like hero because you've mastered this kind of secret esoteric universe uh, and nobody else can understand it and you can't talk to anybody about it. Uh, uh, <laughs> but you know... And maybe that was how it worked, you know, because you've now passed through the portal of sensible world into the mad world of, of Heidegger, where you become like this kind of genius who can see the inauthenticity of, of being. And maybe that was his real kind of uh, attraction. Tim, anything you want to come back on or should I keep going? Um, no, keep going. Keep, keep going. Okay. So if... It, just there, and then I'll come to this side of the room after that. Uh, Steve Moxon. Um, I take issue with this idea of crisis. What crisis? I really don't think there was a there was status striving, as ever, perennially there is status striving. And obviously, it, in the thick of that, one tactic is to shift the goalposts. Uh, in particular, trying to pass off status striving as something else. And of course, leftism is the apotheosis of this. 
It's, it's uh, presenting your own status of striving as someone else's. Um, and, and obviously, that's why we're living in this totalitarian leftist political, political totalitarianism now, which is, uh, if you, you repeat it, it ad nauseum, eventually it becomes a, a self-fulfilling prophecy. That's the idea of it. So I don't think there's any crisis at all. It's, it's plus a change. Okay, so right at the back, uh, there's a hand there. And then, Ella, if you go to Carlton. Uh, <coughs> Thanks, Tim, for your lecture. It's absolutely fascinating. I've just got a, a, a question, and if it's outside of the time frame, um, you know, please just ignore it. But I'm, I'm interested, to what extent do you see that crisis of bourgeois ideology, that sense of disenchantment, um, being temporarily resolved through the Second World War? Uh, I mean, I'm thinking of you know, America that, and Britain in that sort of 1945 to sort of 60 period it feels optimistic. I mean, you know, uh, and if you look at Orwell, you know, in The Lion and Unicorn, there's a sense of something coming through. You know, that disenchantment being resolved through an incorporation of state socialism, I suppose, uh, you know, the welfare state as a compromise, the critique of the market being built into a reinvigoration of the state, May, maybe, you know, particularly in, in, in Britain and in America, but do, do, can they offset that? temporarily for that short period until the counterculture of the 60s sort of starts to really challenge things again. Okay, I'll take Carlton and then I'll come back to you, Tim. Okay. Uh, Tim, I may be preempting perhaps some of tomorrow's discussion, but I was struck by your kind of <coughs> uh, statement, although kind of Germany lost the war, Nietzsche won, and the kind of motif that the, the dominant motif in the post-war period becomes bourgeois modernity is shit, basically. And it kind of struck me that sounds kind of precisely like the kind of Frankfurt School uh, kind of analysis, and particularly when they kind of decamp to the United States and the kind of the shock that the kind of the, the Adorno et al. have with the kind of the reality of, of the new world and, and modernity. I just wondered if you could kind of perhaps T pick that apart a, a bit more in the sense of kind of, is it the case that the kind of, the Marxist critique becomes a kind of Nietzschean critique or kind of how that pans itself out in, in the long term? Okay, if you can hand the mic to Jacob and we'll come back to you first, Jacob, and I'll take Tim back in now. And the other mic go to the left there. Yes. So, oh, I'm over sorry, to you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Right. Um, the question uh, of whether um, there's anything particularly new after 1848 or whether it's just a recycling of uh, uh, romanticism. Um, on the one hand, I did try to uh, address that uh, during the lecture by suggesting that romanticism proper, late uh, 18th century, uh, early 19th century romanticism, uh, there was a tremendous amount of enthusiasm for um, what we might want to call uh, bourgeois democratic revolutions. There's a tremendous amount of enthusiasm for the French Revolution. They, they uh, allied themselves in sentiment uh, and even criticism with that cause. Uh, so they, they, they see themselves on that side of, that side of history. Um, but deeper still, I think there was a distinction between, um, say, Nietzsche's idea of what we really are as a kind of natural desiring, vitalistic, instinctual creature and, you know, letting those drives out. And the, the rather more positive conception of what a human nature might be, which you find in certainly someone like Rousseau. Um, so that even when Rousseau, who's seen as a semi, well, as a, as a, romantic, as a romantic precursor, uh, because he seems to uh, raise criticisms of, of mainstream Enlightenment thinkers, um, even when he um, suggests or wants to suggest that we can authorize our actions through appealing to our feelings and our sentiments, uh, there's still a kind of uh, rationality to that move. Uh, so his principal example of that really is, is almost being free to marry who you love, right? And defying the conventions of the day which suggest, uh, well, which demand that you have to marry who your parents say you're going to marry. That, you know, he writes that in his epistolary novel, uh, uh, Julie. Um, 
so there's a kind of there's a there's a rational component to the to the nature which uh, Rousseau thinks should be allowed to authorize our uh, behaviour and actions. Uh, Rousseau and later on are always searching for that reconciliation, if you like, of uh, reason, uh, a, a rational notion of autonomy, and the extent to which that rational notion of autonomy can be uh, infused and informed by sentiment, feeling, and passion, and so on. Even Marx himself will talk about man being a passionate, desiring uh, 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 species or uh, being, which he does in the 1840, uh, 1844 Paris manuscripts. So I think, that's, I think there's a massive distinction between that and what Nietzsche starts to articulate, which is an entirely irrational conception of what it is to really to be a human, to really let things go. Um, so that, that, I, I think there was... I probably perhaps not done, a, done it there, but I, th I think there is, a, there, is a, there is a fine but important distinction to be drawn between that earlier notion of an appeal to uh, a natural uh, individual and the later one, which is irrational and opposed directly, posed directly at uh, the seeming ra oppressive rationality of bourgeois society. Um, Someone mentioned the Frankfurt School. Uh, the Frankfurt School are of that moment, really. They're a later version of that Nietzsche, uh, Weber, Freud axis, I think. Um, Herbert Marcuse is famously a student of uh, Martin Heidegger. Um, and their critique of... The, well, their the critique of enlightenment reason is almost drawn entirely, well, not drawn entirely, it draws its force, I think, from Weber's critique of the instrumental rationality of capitalism after that reason uh, ceases to be sanctified by any religious purpose. Uh, so that's how I think those two kind of mesh. Um, someone mentioned, uh, Kevin mentioned uh, degeneracy. Uh, yeah, I think that Nietzsche actually avoids any of that explicit racialization of decline. Um, but it's there. It's, it's, it's there all around Nietzsche. And it's, it's, it's very obvious and palpable in 1920s England as well. Uh, there's an attempt to explain uh, decline and decadence in terms of the decline, the racial and biological decline of a certain section of the population. Uh, hence you get... Uh, you famously get the, uh, I forget what it was, the Malthusian balls start to, start to be staged where, you know, the, 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 there's this desire to um, uh, ensure that people of, the, of low social standing don't give birth to too many children because they'll end up making things worse. So there's an attempt to explain away and explain that, uh, that phenomenon of decadence which Nietzsche sees as a predominantly a kind of social uh, uh, phenomenon as a biological phenomenon. So that's, that's certainly there. Um, I'm going to let other people talk, actually. Yeah, okay. So, uh, Jacob first, because you've got the mic, and then we'll, we'll get everyone in. Yeah, uh, thanks, Emma. That was, that was really interesting. But I um, wonder just the degree to which you'd accept a slightly different spin on, especially Nietzsche, but to a lesser extent Heidegger, because you can present them on the one hand as these intellectuals that bring down a sort of, or, or put their energies against a particular set of sort of bourgeois norms. Or in the case of Nietzsche, you can look at someone who looks around him at a society that's lost confidence in its bourgeois norms. And then, and this is really the other side of Nietzsche, is someone who's racked with the question and the, the, what he feels is the impossible task of trying to find something to put in its place. And so he then, he then obviously, as you mentioned, latches onto this notion of vitalism and of the, the great blonde beast that will go and sort of revalue all values. But the, the, I think it, it makes a difference as to whether you situate him as sort of pushing against it and having the positive vision that pushes against the decadence of bourgeois morality, or whether you see him first as anticipating a certain kind of decadence. But and the reason why I think that's important and how it links to Heidegger is because it... The, the, the mistake that these intellectuals make, I suggest, is more that they think they themselves, in the comfort of their study, are faced with this problem of finding new values. And so, in Heidegger's case, the famously short, almost barely even a section in Being and Time where he talks about authentic being with others. It's like, obviously, it's an impossible situation. How do you, in the comfort of your study, go off and create some new values? Whereas if you think of it 
Um, obviously, the, the, this is the later critique, especially of Arendt's critique of Heidegger, where if you think of us already with people engaged in politics or the social realm as potentially being the locus of where we can realize ourselves and make new values, that is sort of where you're able to sort of identify the mistake that those thinkers make. Okay, someone's got a mic over here. Alka should get that mic next. Yes. Um, just, just very briefly, I, I wondered if Tim wanted to say anything about the idea of the value giver in relation to Weber's account of the Protestant ethic. I mean, he, it, it seemed, reading Bloom, there seems to be some sort of continuity with this idea that there is this, just this great value giver who turns up and bestows values. And I wondered how much that feeds forward into the 60s, where you have almost this sense of people becoming involved in um, advocacy, you know, human rights projects, and it's almost done in indifference to the people they're trying to liberate. Okay, so that mic goes on to back there, uh, Alka. <coughs> okay, thanks, Tim. It's just a question I had really on your concluding, on your concluding um, point, where you if I got you right, you were suggesting that there was a sort of source for the quest for identity could be traced back to, um, to he Nietzsche and Heidegger. But I was... I, and I, I can find that kind of compelling, but there is a question I've got about an important difference, because it seems to me uh, that with, with Heidegger, the, the quest for identity is also, you know, it's kind of very much linked to responsibility as well. It is you, you, are, you are responsible to keep finding your identity, to keep finding your values, and you do that in a continual round of contestation with other viable contending you know, theories or con conceptions. And I'm just wondering, uh, that does seem kind of different to today, where the kind of quest for identity seems to lack that kind of depth and seems to be more, not less individualistic. It's like you find your identity through locating a group, and then once you're fitted yourself in a group, you kind of then kind of got things sorted. So I just wondered if you thought that was a relevant difference or whether that, the similarities are greater. Okay. So Ella, this mic's coming down to Daniel and someone's got a mic up there. So Who's I've got, got the mic. Yes. So, um, yes, Tim, I, I thought your, your, your analysis was very, very astute and, you know, making, putting it all in line with the breakdown of any hope of a, a positive democratic change, which I think was very much characteristic of Germany in the late uh, 19th century. So, um, the, you know, this complete void, this complete positive kind of vision, which we, yeah, the, the lack of a positive vision. But where I do think there is a bit of a problem is that Heidegger, uh, that Nietzsche was often linked to fascism, and you didn't do that, but you did insinuate that a little bit, and I, I think that's a bit too that's a bit too easy. So I think it's quite well established that Nietzsche, for example, wasn't an anti-Semite. I think you can, you know, you have to be a bit careful because you're kind of picking out certain quotes, but you could find other quotes in Nietzsche too, where in fact where he's very much criticizes anti-Semitism. And there was very much this kind of, uh, you know, like, like Max Weber also talking about a Führer personality, which wasn't particularly, it's often linked then later to fascism, but it's a bit of reading history backward. Because really what these people were, were, were talking about was something much broader. And uh, he did, his, his Nazi sister, you're right, his Nazi sister used him very much and is very much responsible for that kind of image uh, Nietzsche has today. But I'm not sure if that's uh, entirely fair because there's a lot of other people which were abused and misused uh, afterwards by fascism. So I think what I'm trying to say is that I think we have to be a bit more careful in, uh, in, in, in seeing history in this kind of, or, or Nietzsche in this kind of clear continuity. I, I don't think that's 100% correct, because I do think he reflects something much broader going on in Europe. And in that sense, I also think the, the link made to Rousseau isn't, isn't completely wrong. You know, the idea that Rousseau was also talking about um, bourgeois society or even Christianity um, going against what's natural in man. That's just my point, because I just wanted to know about this link to fascism, which I think you insinuated, which I don't think is 100% fair. Okay. Daniel, can I, can I just get a sense of how many people I've got to, still got to get in? So I'll just keep going to the end and you'll have about three minutes to come back on 
whatever you need to. <laughs> yeah. Um, yes, Daniel. Okay, yeah, really interesting talk, which I'm still thinking about. And what, one question that comes out of it is, do you think it's worth distinguishing between related but different kinds of culture wars? Uh, so, for example, one type could be a battle between different cultural viewpoints or a, a battle between uh, German culture and French civilization, so different viewpoints. And a slightly different thing, which, you, again, you did allude to in your talk, uh, which is a conflict between high and low culture. So, for example, as I understand it, culture, as it was used in Germany in the early 20th century, doesn't quite mean what culture means in English today, specifically referring to high culture. So, you know, in the First World War, Germany, or the German intellectuals anyway, were saying, you yeah, know, we are fighting for, you know, Goethe and Schiller and Beethoven against the kind of inferior French and British culture. But then you, you uh, painted very clearly how, particularly after the First World War, there was very much an attack on, I think you referred to bourgeois culture, but you could also say high culture, which is a, a different kind of culture. It was a kind of undermining of high culture, uh, which seems to have, uh, if anything, gathered pace since then. So is it worth making that distinction? What's your take on that question? OK. Um, so Penny there, and then I'll come to you. Uh, and then to you, and I think that will be about it. Um, slightly confused um, question. I think um, Lukash in The Destruction of Reason talks quite a lot about vitalism, and one of the points he makes about it is that it's sort of holistic in its character, in that it attempts to um, develop a critique of reason, but also as Frank was saying yesterday, is in direct counterposition to the idea of dualism, that we can understand the dialectics of a thing. And so I'm just quite interested, because I think the flatness of contemporary philosophical and psychological discussion, the kind of, the, the aspiration to constantly flatten every discussion and to be against the dualistic nature of things, which Frank, I think, kind of referred to at the beginning of the day, that seems, that's a seed there. Uh, in Nietzsche as well, the, the voluntaristic, atavistic idea that you both experience the world and know the world as the same thing, not as two separate things. So I'm just interested in, you've talked about vitalism a lot. Is it a seed of some other ideas that we see reappearing today in a different form? Okay, if you just put the mic back, and then, Rick, if you put the mic to the guy there with the hand, yeah, that's it. Okay. Uh, the image I always have uh, of Heidegger to sort of try and remind me of what he looked like is not so much the moustache, it's that um, David Frederick painting of the, the man on top of a mountaintop staring out, his back to, to us, staring out at the wilderness. Only for Heidegger, um, everything that he sees has already been given meaning, it's been given colour and category by other people who went before and have named and, and, and given sense to, it, to everything. And he's sort of annoyed with, with, with humanity for having done that because it seems as though he would like to see the landscape raw and naked and he can't ever do that. Now it's been suggested, I can't remember by who, but it has been suggested that this aspect of Heidegger's thinking um, was to some extent influenced by Lukács, who in that famous single phrase states that nature is a, is a social category. Um, and of course, Lukács in, in turn was heavily influenced by Weber. And you can see a sort of continuity there of the sort of the, the pure instrumentality of uh, bourgeois society, the sort of impossibility of either the natural or the transcendent, there is just the contingent that sort of um, has no meaning and, and, and sits in between. So my, my question is, uh, in what sense did Lukács manage to escape that same sort of pessimism that seemed to be um, informing all of the intellectual life at that period? Okay, and so this is going to be the last one, to, and then to maybe just pick up on a couple of things that are going to leave us nicely for tomorrow morning. But yes. 
So just two things briefly. Um, one, I also want to give a positive word to Nietzsche, who I'm a big fan of, uh, and I think got a, a bit of a slighting here. So uh, he, he's not to be known as, I don't think, someone who's just saying that we should all kind of be wild beasts and sensuous and, and what have you. Uh, the emphasis I, th I take from his work is that we should master ourselves. That, that's the kind of central thing that he channels into art, and he wants to make the self a work of art, and it's not about just kind of giving free reign to your impulses and instincts and drives and that kind of thing. Um, on the other hand, uh, the question um, I wanted to ask was about authenticity, whether you think that that is a, a, a useful category or something to be defended. And this uh, question, which um, was raised earlier on, I think somebody mentioned that the link between Rousseau and then through Nietzsche and then also Marx's kind of category of, of um, the sort of species being and that kind of thing as, as a sort of twist, perhaps, on the idea of authenticity. Is that something that is is worth defending, do you think? Okay, so some of these questions will be nice for discussion in the bar later. Some of them will be picked up in some of the sessions tomorrow. But Tim, do you just want to leave us with a couple of minutes of thoughts? Uh, not particularly, no. Uh, <laughs> um, as, as quite a few people have pointed out, uh, my interpretation of Nietzsche was a bit uh, uh, one-sided, or uh, it certainly was a product of my perspective, which I'm sure Nietzsche would actually probably agree with, um, as an approach. Uh, Nietzsche can be used in many different ways. He wrote so many different things. It helps he writes aphoristically, which means you can pick and choose the best quotes to use uh, as, and when, as and when you like. Uh, and his sister did take advantage of that because, you know, she effectively published his compendia of, uh, you know, his, his, his choice quotes, particularly if they favor her, her particular politics. Uh, I don't think Nietzsche there's no point really in talking of Nietzsche as a, as a proto-fascist, uh, but certainly a fascist could use Nietzsche, as could a communist, as could anyone, uh, because Nietzsche has been and still continues to be used by left and right throughout uh, the 20th and 21st century. Uh, he's she, he, he's she, he, goodness me, <laughs> victim of uh, contemporary <laughs> ideology there. Um, <laughs> Nietzsche, on the one hand, you know, seems to be a hero of the alt-right. Uh, on the other hand, he seems to be used by those who uh, perhaps uh, choose a Foucauldian uh, version of Nietzsche to criticize identity politics uh, in the name of so-called bioethics. So Nietzsche, all purpose. Uh, in I contrast that with uh, Martin Heidegger, who, as James points out, is, uh, has a peculiarly uh, idiosyncratic style of writing, which means that you cannot pick and choose Heidegger quotes. I challenge you to, ne to pick your favorite Heidegger quote right now. Um, <laughs> the, the main difficulty with Heidegger, of course, it's very difficult to talk of Heidegger in any other terms other than those which Heidegger used himself, which means that anybody who tried to uh, place themselves in uh, Heidegger's line or Heidegger's tradition of thinking, Jean-Paul Sartre being one, was promptly rejected because they did not write like Heidegger, because the only person who could write like Heidegger was Martin Heidegger. Um, so Martin Heidegger and Nietzsche, two very different cases. Uh, one you can barely appropriate, uh, not without someone going, oh, he didn't really say it. And Nietzsche, appropriate all you like, right? Uh, my Final point, the, the, the pessimism, the, uh, the way in which someone mentioned, I think it was, came up a couple of times, um, the 20s and 30s, yes, it's not just about um, this sense of irreparable damage and decay, this uh, rupture uh, which will never be healed again. Plenty of people look elsewhere for a different way of... Um, a different set of values. You know, of course, at this point, I didn't bother mentioning it, but, you know, communism, the Russian Revolution, inspires many uh, people who hitherto had been attracted, or not hitherto been attracted, hitherto had been just immersed in a bourgeois world. I mentioned E.H. Carr, because I think he's an ex interesting example of that. Uh, he was thoroughly immersed in that long 19th century. His, his way of thinking, you know, he, in the, after the Russian Revolution, E.H. Carr, his main job was to stop any trade with Russia. He worked for the Foreign Office. No, nothing's getting in or out thanks to E.H. Carr. He, you know, he, was, he was part of the British state's war on the Russian, on, on, on the Russian revolutionary state at that point. Um, but E.H. Carr can't live with the, um, the absence of anything particularly uh, valuable or inspiring in society at that moment. So E.H. Carr comes round, effectively, to communism. And that happened a lot throughout the 20s and 30s. So there was an answer to pessimism and disenchantment. It was either in a direct uh, signing up to communism 
or in bourgeois intellectuals who didn't really want to let go. It was a you know, kind of uh, state socialism to Dr. Mosh. So I don't know if that's a particularly pithy way to have ended that, actually. I should have just said that uh, um, something about non-identity and identity politics. But oh, well, another day. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.